We are going to cover two topics which are very closely related. One is reinforcement learning and one is Monte Carlo planning. And the, the distinction between them will get clearer as we get closer to Monte Carlo planning. Now, I am hoping that all of you must have heard the term reinforcement learning. And if you have not, then let's just spend a minute and talk about Pavlov's dog. So Pavlov's dog uh, was learning in a real world and you could train, uh, train the dog by giving reward. And this whole notion fits into the enforcement level. The idea being that our actions are directed towards maximizing our reward and that we can learn the model of the world based on experience. So in this particular case, the dog learns the model of the world <coughs> that as soon as there is a buzzer, there is a light, then he's going to get food. Okay? Whether that learning is accurate or not, I mean, that's a different matter. But reinforcement learning essentially has been studied over the last, you know, so many years, 60 plus years in psychology. Nothing to do with AI, really. In AI, reinforcement learning has happened actually in the last 40, 50 years. But it had already been in existence in the context of psychology and behavioral psychology. Okay. We will try to recall everything that we learned in Markov decision processes lecture. We will not use value iteration or anything, but we will just recall the, the high level point that we were in because this builds forward from the Markov decision process literature. So, what we learned then is that we have a model. The model has states, actions, transition probabilities, rewards, and <coughs> based on doing value iteration or some kind of processing which is equivalent to inference, if you want to think about Bayesian networks, we would learn a value for each state and based on knowing the value of each state, we would know what is the right action to do in that state. Okay. However, we assume that the model was given to us. This is the planning problem because the model is completely known. We know the transition probabilities and we know the rewards. True, same for blackjack. In an infinite deck, we know that the probability of the next card is 1 over 13 and we know that the reward is 2.5, 1.5, or whatever. 1, 1.5, 0, and minus 1. You all have done this assignment. So the good news is that because we are in the infinite deck case in blackjack, we know all the probabilities. Now suppose I tell you, you have eight decks. And you may not be starting from the beginning. You may be starting from somewhere in the middle. Now go solve blackjack. Which is really the real problem, right? How would you go about doing this? You don't know the probability of the next card because you don't know what has gone. You don't know how many cards have gone. So you may have to come up with some probability distribution on top of it and you might be able to work it out. But in reality, in general, what happens is that, see, blackjack is still clear because there are, are cards and you know you can count the cards and so on. In usual real world, like think of a baby who is just born. They want to increase their reward. What is their reward? Well, their butt remains clean and they get milk and you know all of those nice things sleep. But they don't know which of their actions lead them to good reward and which of their actions do not lead them to good reward. They don't know which action changes what in the world. So what is their problem? Their problem is to learn the model of the world while trying to maximize their reward. And this problem that the children have is the reinforcement learning problem. We will have the same model. Now we will of course talk in terms of models, but the, the, the generality <coughs> and the reality of it is much, much broader. <coughs> so the model again would be that we have a set of states and we have a set of actions and we have a transition model and a reward model and we're still looking for the policy because that is what we are, that's in our control. We want to maximize our reward, right? By the way, there is a lot of uh, evidence to the fact that humans and animals and all of us are reward oriented. We have some notion of extrinsic reward, we have some notion of intrinsic reward. So actually the notion of reward is integral to the way we are built. It's very interesting, fascinating, we won't get into it. But model-wise, the twist is that we do not know the transition probabilities and we do not know the reward model. We only know the states and actions and we want to maximize our reward and find the policy. So that is the problem that we are studying. 
because we do not know transition and reward, you can't just implement value iteration and say, okay, I've got my optimal policy. What you have to do is that because you don't know which states are good, which states are bad, you actually have to try actions. Assuming, suppose that you have been, you know, put in a in a helicopter and dropped in a new location completely, new country. You can't read, you can't, you have to start learning in this new surrounding all over again. So here you don't know, uh, uh, or suppose you have been dropped and put into a new game. That's, that's, that's been easy way for you to understand. So you don't, you know some notion of, you know, what is good reward and bad reward, but you don't know where you get it. You don't know how to get there. You don't know what happens if you try to kill this particular monster. Oh, this was a good monster. I killed a good monster. All of those things can happen. And how will you figure that out? By playing. By playing once, by playing twice, by playing 100 times, and maybe 100 first time, you will become better and cross the level. So that is a reinforcement learning problem. We are taking actions, but we are also learning about the world while we are taking actions. Our goal is still to maximize our reward, but we don't know the world yet. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the reinforcement learning problem. Any questions on the, on the motivation and the goal? Notice that this is a learning problem. This is not a planning problem. You can make this same distinction as we did in Bayesian networks. First we learned how to do queries, how to do inference, how to compute the probabilities once we know the conditional probability table. Then we said, it's great, but we never know the conditional probability table. So how, what do we do? Well, we estimate conditional probability tables by data. Reinforcement learning is even one step more interesting, but we'll get to that. I'm learning ahead of myself, but let's stick to the parallel. The parallel here is value iteration is inference. Everything is known to us, we just want to do the computation to figure out what's the best action. That is inference in some world way. Now we are in the learning setup where we do not know the conditional probability table, but we will have data. Okay? Yes, Jude. Does the implementation have to be online in the sense of like it has to keep learning as it's encountering the world, or can you say learn a little bit, develop some model, use that as my. Yes, you're asking a fantastic question. The question is. Do I learn throughout or do I have a full well-defined learning phase and then well-defined phase where I have learned everything and now I'm just, you know, doing value iteration. And both of those are possibilities. Some will fit one possibility, some will fit another. Some, there is a pro and there is a con. <coughs> In fact, what you just described about having a first learning phase and then learning the model, that's called model-based reinforcement learning. And then there's another possibility where you don't, nev you never learn the model. That's called model-free reinforcement learning, and we'll talk about it, how it can be done. But that's one of the dimensions of reinforcement learning, whether I'm learning the model explicitly or I'm not learning the model explicitly. Recall that when we talked about Markov decision processes, we first said, let's talk about how to evaluate the policy. Because once we don't know how to evaluate the policy, it will be very difficult for us to know how to take the right action, right? How to do a search of a space of policy. So that same, the same distinction will hold and we'll spend some time doing passive reinforcement learning. A passive reinforcement learning would be one where the policy is given to us. We still don't know how much value it leads, what are the transition probabilities and rewards, but we have known the policy. That is called passive reinforcement learning. It's not very interesting, but it's an important pedagogical device to move, get up to what is the real problem, which is active reinforcement learning, where we have to figure out what actions to take uh, at the same time, so learn the policy. <coughs> in, in value iteration, our basic tool was Bellman backup. Now we can't even do Bellman backup. Why can we not do Bellman backup? Someone didn't do paper. We do not have the transition <laughs> probabilities. For Bellman backup, we need to take the transition probability over all successor states. If we don't have transition probabilities, we can never do full backup. If we, however, have the transition probabilities but don't have the rewards, we can do full backup. So that difference will happen whether I'm doing full backup or I'm just doing what is called the TD learning, temporal difference learning, okay? And we'll talk about that. And the last dimension that we'll talk about is that do we have access to a simulator or are we really in the real world? And uh, the notion of a simulator is that I can jump to any state randomly and simulate what's going to happen to me in the future. Okay, and for some problems that is given to us and if it is given to us, we can exploit it in our learning problem. And this is called Monte Carlo planning and we'll talk about that. 
If we do not have the simulator, however, then we cannot teleport. We have to just start one step at a time and keep doing, and we can only visit the states that we visit while taking the actions. And that is a real reinforcement learning problem that the babies have to do. They can't say that, oh, reset, let me start over, or let me you know, go 10 days back in time or whatever. You, you are leading one life, right? So that is a real reinforcement learning problem. So these are my various dimensions, and we'll t cover a subset of algorithms in this space. Yes. So for the weak student, I've said I, you cannot teleport. Yes, I cannot teleport to a student. Thank you. I'll correct it. Okay. <coughs> and, I, I, and as I have said uh, already, this has been studied in psychology for a long time. So our rewards are food, pain, hunger, drugs. And actually, it has been shown that there is something called dopamine that our brain produces. And, the act, and that tells us that we got reward. And different things produce this dopamine. Food produces it, and uh, uh, drugs produce it. And that is why we, we once somebody is uh, uh, addicted to drugs, they want to go back and back because they are getting that reward that is coming from their dopamine. So, so it has been more or less established that some form of reinforcement learning is happening inside our brains. And we'll talk a little bit about it in the middle of the class. Here's another example for aging. So bees have to plan their uh, uh, eating plan when they have flowers around and they have to, you know, uh, so if you create these uh, artificial flowers for the winter, for example, then bees really learn near optimal foraging plan somehow or the other, and it has been uh, studied that they have some neural connections that connect their motor planning skills to their nectar intake. So again, some form of connection between their actions and the reward. Okay. Now, it has obviously been extremely used in games. So here's one example, backgammon. So in backgammon, one of the earliest, uh, so in 1992, I think this was, there was a temporal difference learning, which we will talk about. Uh, reinforcement learning based backgammon uh, played much better than anything that was happening before. And what it did, it just played against itself. And as it was playing against itself, it kept updating its values and kept doing reinforcement learning and slowly, slowly, slowly got to a better policy. Pretty awesome, actually. Of course, uh, babies don't get to simulate the world, babies don't get to do this over and over, but this is a very interesting possibility if we can do that. So enough for the motivation. Let me just, uh, let me now start with the, the algorithmic side of it. And in the first part of, uh, the class. I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning. So no simulator. We, we are doing what we are doing and that is the only state we can visit. <coughs> maybe we have a reset button that we can restart, maybe not. I don't know. The task is, first we do passive learning. So the task is that we are given a policy. We don't know the transitions and reward. Our goal is to learn the state value. Okay. Now, here is one form of the problem. So this is my domain. This is a state which gives 100 reward. This is a state which gives minus 100 reward. Minus plus one, minus one is also a possibility. Uh, this is the policy that is given to me. The actions are stochastic. So if I take an uh, up action, let's say in one, two, I took an up action. Uh, I don't always go to one, three, I may go to I may stay in the same state or maybe go down or you know left, right with small probabilities. But we don't know those probabilities. What we know is that, okay, we started here and we followed this policy and we reached this goal using this set of actions, I mean this set of states. So I was in 1, 1, then in 1, 2, and then I stayed in 1, 2, then I got to 1, 3, then I got to 2, 3, then I got to 3, 3, then I got to 3, 2, then I got to 3, 3, and then I got to four. So this is a trajectory that is given to me. So I started in my state, and I kept doing, kept following this policy, and eventually I terminated in one of the goal states. I got the high reward. I am done. Mike. So up and right are the names of the actions. The actions are stochastic. So I try to go up, and with high probability I go up, but with small probability I may go elsewhere. <coughs> so if I want, so suppose I just gave you this problem. I said, all right, these are my trajectories. And you need to compute what is the value of each state, long-term reward starting in a state S. Recall that in MDPs we compute what is called a V star of S, right? And we can't have a star anymore, or same thing. 
we want to compute value of the state starting in the state s reaching the goal how would you do that you have to learn the values given some sample trajectory work backwards from the like at the end you know you want and yes and that is one possibility but let me start with something even simpler it's called direct estimation how many times am i starting from 1 1 one of the times i got a reward of 100 one of the times i got a reward of minus 100 let us suppose each action takes minus 1 costs minus 1 okay so this is a trajectory of length 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 actions or eight <coughs> and this is a trajectory of six actions. So in the first case, trajectory of eight actions, <coughs> I got to a reward of 100. What is the cumulative reward starting for this trajectory starting in 1, 1? 92. And what is the cumulative reward starting in 1, 1 following this trajectory? Minus 106. So if I was just doing simple estimation, I would say that the value starting in 1, 1 is the average of all the trajectories that I have seen starting in that state, which is sort of similar to what you were saying, but this is even more direct. So this would be 92 minus 106 over 2 minus 7. If you talk about 3, 3, then I am starting from 3, 3 here, I am starting from 3, 3 here, and I am starting from 3, 3 here. So you can count this as three different runs, and so I get a reward of 31 point. This is just a very simple basic algorithm to get us, get our hands dirty. Everybody okay with this? Because if you're not okay with this, then right to the well, What's the point? We've already got the policy. This is a pedagogical device. So the okay. point is that we will make, get to learning the policy, but let's just talk about the concepts. So if this was the issue, and we had to figure out what's the value of reaching the goal, or what's the value of the total reward, using the trajectories, we could just add an average. So first of all, it? And it's just done for once per state. Once per state. Right. Now, what is a major problem with this? The policy. It is definitely highly dependent on the policy, but the policy is given to us. That's the problem we are solving. So that's all right. But it's dependent on this particular trajectory. The, those two are representative of the whole richness. No, no, you will have thousand trajectories. That's uh, see, there is an internal consistency within the Markov decision process. What is the internal consistency? The value of this state depends on the value of the next states plus the immediate reward and transition probabilities mixed in, right? That internal consistency is just not there in the direct estimation approach. Let's uh, <coughs> take this, 2, 3, right? <coughs> so value of 2, 3 would be 1, 2, 3, 4, so minus 90, uh, plus 96, and uh, minus 104 divided by 2, which will be about um, really small. Whereas value of 3, 3 is 31, and we know that the value of 2, 3 should be value of 33 3 minus 1, approximately. I mean, there is a probability that it will not do the exact thing, but approximately. And that consistency is sort of lost. Well, it's because we're weighting the path values in the end sort of the same. Yeah, but all paths are equal, because all yeah, data points are equal. But so the path values are getting lost in the, the, the scale of the final reward. I didn't get that. Well, your, your path values that you've given are on the order of, you know, 8, 9, 6, and your final reward are plus or minus 3 orders of magnitude, 2 orders of magnitude more than that. But, in, right, so even if that was not the case, I don't think that will change anything. Because really, because we are doing direct estimation, we are not explicitly ensuring that that consistency of a Markov decision process shows up in the computations. Okay? So the goal that we will have now is to see whether we can do some kind of a dynamic programming so that the values that we come up with are relatively more consistent. <coughs> so what could be a simple idea? The idea that Jude gave very early in the game. You have trajectories. Why do you want to estimate values directly? Why not estimate the model? The model. Exactly. <coughs> we have a model. We know what the model is. We do not know the parameters of the model. If we have trajectories, instead of directly computing the value, which should really be a dynamic programming based solution on top of the MDP and so on, why not estimate the model? Now once we estimate the model, there may be some error within the model itself, which is fine, but the computation on top of it will have this uh, much, much cleaner semantics. Does that make sense? So 
we know how to estimate the model, right? So we count for each s comma a how many times we saw s prime. And that gives me some transition probabilities. It's like estimating probabilities. We can do some little bit of smoothing or whatever it is. We got as transition probabilities. Similarly, if with some state we have associated a reward that we get, we just memorize that. And so now we have estimated reward. We have estimated transition probabilities based on our data. And once you've done it, what can we do? Value iteration. So here's an example. Suppose I want to estimate what is the probability that from 3-3, three, three, if I take a right, I'm going to go to 4-3. Well, if I was here in 3-3, three, three, I took a right, I went to 3-2. Here, I went to 4-3. Here, I went to 3-2. So the probability is 1 over 3. And so on. So we can now estimate the probabilities. Now we have estimated the probabilities. You know how to solve the MTP. Everybody OK? How many parameters do we have to estimate, by the way? Sorry? If I have S states and A actions, then? No, but if, if, if the policy is there, you only have one action. You cannot see what probability for the other actions is because you're following the policy. That is right? true. That is true. Uh, so you're right. OK. So I take that back. But all right. Suppose even though I'm given the policy, how, how many parameters am I estimating in this particular case? For each state, I know the action. But I have to go through, go look at the probability distribution of all possible states. So it is s times s. So we are estimating s square parameters. And in reality, if uh, we did not, if we were not given this policy, we will be estimating s square a parameters. So it's very data intensive, but it is possible. Kiran, I'm not sure. I policy is given to us. So in every state, I'm executing the same action over and over. So, so for each state. How many states could I potentially transition to? S states. So how many parameters am I estimating? S times? But you have a little bit of knowledge. Like you know that if you're in If you had a little bit of knowledge, you can go a long way. Yes. A little knowledge is very, very useful here. If you knew that you can only go to, say, only your neighborhood states, then you have to estimate much less number of parameters. That is so much better already. So yes. If you're given some initial knowledge about your domain, you can do things. Let's move forward. So then we can do a step further. Right? So you <coughs> said, let's have a learning step, then let's have a planning step. But what we can do, we can have a learning step. Based on that, we compute a better policy. So now we are no longer in passive world. Now we are starting up and see, figuring out what are the best actions to take. Right? So we started with some policy. We learned the parameters. Based on that, maybe we learn a new policy. And then, based on that, we re-estimate our parameters and keep doing this over and over and over. Let's call it adaptive dynamic programming. Why is it adaptive? We did dynamic programming for value iteration. Then we adaptively re-estimated our parameters, did some learning, then we did the dynamic programming. Okay? The idea is very simple. I hope it is clear. Let's see the problem. So suppose <coughs> this is the first policy we came up with. Now we know that we are going to follow it for some time and get some more data to learn the parameters better. <coughs> so far, so good. But the problem is that we are never going to hit this state. We are never going to hit this state. Since we are never going to hit those states, we are never going to learn the probability of taking the up action, or probability or the value of going, starting in this state and going to the right. What went wrong? Um, you didn't do considering your neighborhood, you're, you're, you're not even going to find your local optima. That's not a good <coughs> policy for exploring policy. Good. So you guys are getting towards what is the biggest biggest learning from reinforcement <coughs> learning class. Something called exploration, exploitation trade-off. We'll talk more about this in some time, but the bottom line is that there is a tussle. There's a tussle between <coughs> maximizing reward based on what I have learned already and taking actions not to maximize reward, but to learn about the world better. See, it's like this. You're playing this game, and now you've figured out how to cross this level. Once you figure it out once, there are different of us, different people will do differently. We will, I will cross the level and look, worry about the next level. Some other people will say, oh, let me see if there is a better way to cross the level. 
an easier way to cross the level. Or I can cross the level with more points. What they will do? They will actually not optimize the reward, or at least local reward. <laughs> they will optimize for information gathering in the hope that in the long term they will get <coughs> better reward. You know, it's like this. Suppose you go to this new restaurant, right? You have no idea whether you're going to like anything or not. And then you order the first dish. You don't <coughs> like it. So far, so good. Next time, if your friend forces you to go there, you order maybe the second dish. And this time, you like it. But the third time, people like me, they order the same dish. <laughs> <laughs> because I am so you know, focused on maximizing my reward. But another person may say, OK, I like this one dish. I'm not like this other dish. Maybe the third dish I would like even more. Why not I explore that? So there is this very natural exploration, exploitation <coughs> trade off that happens when I am learning <coughs> while acting, which happens in reinforcement learning. Yes? I think I saw, I mean, I saw this a little bit in the first assignment when I, I did a genetic algorithm and choosing like how much to continue to mutate the successful uh, good pop from the previous generation versus how much to. Um, or is that something different? <coughs> um, Let's see, let me try and make that connection. So, so you are saying that mutation is sort of, so crossing over is sort of exploitation. Yes. Because I have already got some good states, and I'm marrying that, those good states for a better uh, offspring. Yep. But mutation, although a little bit more on the exploitation side, it's still uh, uh, exploitation, because at least the other part of the state is good, and I'm only mutating really part of it. If I was mutating a lot, there will be more exposition. So I guess I see a connection. But usually people don't use those terms together. <coughs> Same intuition. So OK, so this is a very general concept. We always see this in life. You know, um, It really happens with researchers. It happens, is this job at Microsoft the best job, or should I change this job? Who knows? You're only going to lead one life. You can maximize your reward based on your current expectations, or you can do some exploration. You might actually go down. Maybe you can come back to Microsoft or whichever <laughs> company you guys work for, or whatever. This is this is life. Right? So let's see if we can build model to solve life. Uh, okay. So I'm going to talk about exploitation exploitation more very soon. But let me talk about model-free learning, which is the flip side of model-based learning. So here, what we were doing, we were learning the transition probabilities, which is a lot of models, a lot of parameters, s square or s square a. Let me take you through the possibility of never learning the transition probabilities and still figuring out what is the best action or what's the value. It is possible in the following way. So the first intuition that we will use is the following. Suppose I did not know the probabilities, so I can't do the Bernoulli backup. But I had the possibility of trying this action over and over and over. And if I just did average, of the value that I will get, will I get the same value that I was trying to estimate, which is summation t of the long-term reward? It's actually it's a subtle point. Suppose, yes, let's let's take an example. Suppose I can take this action and I go to state s1 with probability 0.9 and state s2 with probability 0.1. Okay? And in s1, I get a reward of 10, and in s2, I get a reward of so really, the value that I want to learn is 10 times 0.9 plus 0.1 times 5, which is 9.5. This is the value that I want to learn. Instead of knowing these probabilities, suppose I said, give me the next state, S1, 10. Next state, S2, 5. Next state, S1, 10. Next state, S1, 10. Because this is 0.9, this is 0.1, I'm going to get this state more and more and more. And if here, sitting here, I just did the average without worrying about the probabilities, am I going to converge to the same value? Yes. yes. That's exactly. What, that's what expected value is. Exactly. So I can do, I can learn my value without really knowing the transition probabilities if I could do many, many more trials just like this. So far, so good? This is the idea of, this is the first idea of temporal difference learning. Okay? So my pol I'm still in the domain where policy is fixed. I'm learning the values. I'm going to learn the value based on nudging it towards whatever successor occurs. So let me give you the equation first. It may not be very clear, so we'll do the math then. 
So the equation is, I want to compute this value, v, v pi of s, which is sum over the transition probabilities, immediate reward plus gamma times long term reward starting with the successor state. Now suppose I was in this state, I did this action, pi, I got some RSA s prime and I have some estimate of uh, v pi of s prime. So this is a sample. Why am I calling it a sample? Because I executed it and I got some reward. Okay. So this is my sample. My update equation would be, my next value is equal to my previous value plus some learning rate times the difference in the sample value minus the previous value. So intuitively this is, I estimated my v pi to be 5, but I got a 10. What do I do? I push my value from 5 to words 10. That's the intuition. Okay, and so the equation is, new value is equal to previous value plus some learning rates, the prediction error. Everybody okay with the equation? Now let me prove that it actually take, gets you to, it actually makes sense in terms of what we want to compute. It's almost a pin controller. Uh, sorry? It, it, it's, 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 a, it's a like a proportional controller. Control theory and uh, reinforcement learning is one of the same. Yes. How do you compute the value of S prime? You, uh, uh, dynamic programs, so you keep estimating them and they become better and better. So, what do I want to compute? I want to compute a mean of n points, right? I, as we talked about, 0.9 probability, 0.1 probability, I'm taking samples and I'm computing the mean. So I'm, what, I, what I want to compute is the average of n data points. Let's say average of n plus 1 data points. So this is my average of n plus 1 data points, 1 over n plus 1, summation xi. This is what I want to compute. What I have, I can rewrite it as follows. You can check the math, it's, not, uh, it's straightforward. 1 over n average of the first n data points plus 1 over n plus 1 then and then n plus 1 is data point minus the average of the first n data points. You can do the math. Uh, this becomes, uh, the denominator becomes n times n plus 1. This becomes n plus 1. This becomes uh, 1. So n plus 1 minus 1 becomes n. So n and then get, gets cancelled and you are left with 1 over n plus 1. So it's exactly the same equation. Algebraically, I have changed it slightly. Now you can see where I am going. This is the previous average and this is the difference x n plus 1 minus the previous average. Now here, although, there is a very well-defined alpha, which is 1 over n plus 1. But you can see that this form, the previous average plus some rate times the difference, is the exact form. And so if I chose my alpha to be 1 over t or something, <coughs> 1 over data points, then this would be exactly this. Um, in practice, however, we do not usually use this. Um, because what happens is that this v pi of s prime is also being continually estimated. We, are, we don't know this, we are also estimating those. So in some sense, these are noisy samples. These samples are not accurate samples, these are noisy samples. And so we use slightly different alphas. But you can prove, and you know this is actually non-trivial, so I'm not going to prove it. But if your learning rate decreases appropriately with the number of samples, so 1 over n is one example <coughs> that we proved just, then the value estimates will converge to the true values. And the true value is given by this Bellman equation. Why do we need, Why do we need alpha? Uh, what would be the alternative? what happens is, um, right, so you are saying that the, the form is fine, your alpha can, should be 1 over t, or just the, just exactly 1 over n plus 1. Right. Alpha is not 1, obviously, because, uh, He's asking what's the problem with alpha. Since v pi of s and v pi of s get, get cancelled, and your v pi of s becomes just sample. So every, new, so your values will keep oscillating over and over very rapidly. Obviously, alpha can't be 1. Here what we have proven is that alpha, if 1 plus one over n plus 1 really makes sense together because the equations make sense. What I am saying is that you don't necessarily need it to be 1 over n plus 1, which is, should be the right value. You need some conditions over alpha, and if you have the right conditions over alpha, and the conditions are that sum over alpha for every state action pair over time should be equal to infinity, but sum over alpha square should be less than infinity. Again, the, the exact conditions don't matter. Um, 
if you have those conditions, then you can prove that this V pi of S converges. So we haven't talked about convergence yet. It converges and it converges to the true value, that is the optimal value that you wanted to compute. Yeah? Shouldn't alpha increase instead of decrease because as time goes by, the value of S prime, it's more accurate, right? So why do you want the first ones to have more alpha, like alpha B? So if you have, if you have already learned from 100 samples, and you got a 100 first sample, which is different, should you move the value a lot, or should you move the value a little bit? You want to move it a lot because maybe your the value of the S prime back then wasn't very accurate, and the new value of S prime is more accurate, right? Uh, th that's an interesting thought, but uh, usually, this all this whole process slowly starts to converge, right? So it is true that but, uh, that your v prime of v pi of s prime is also changing, and so it might not be very accurate initially. But if you are continuing to increase your alpha, increase your learning rate, <coughs> then it might happen that your values are diverging a lot. So you have to somehow slowly get to that. That is why you need learning rate such that it decreases, but doesn't decrease too fast. Okay. Because if it decreases too fast, you, then you can't you haven't learned the right values. And if it decreases too slowly, then you are not learning enough. So you haven't learned enough. So it's a trade-off, but I guess the higher level point is that I would like you to take from this discussion is that there is this notion of temporal difference learning. It has a very nice intuitive representation. And I have some understanding of what my value should be. I got a new data point, and it is not what I expected. If it is not what I expected, I nudge myself. I learn a little bit in that direction. That's the temporal difference, that difference between what I expected and what I have, and slowly this learning has to reduce. Under certain theoretical conditions, this whole process beautifully converges and to optimal values. You had a question? Oh, um, if the world is changing, you would want to have a higher... Um, okay, I don't even want to talk about world changing because life just gets crazy. So I think if world is changing, one aspect of what you could do is that you could start for getting really old samples. Okay, and so so you have a window of the samples, and you are slowly reestimating based on this window as opposed to it. It's not exactly about control theory. I mean, it really is. These are exactly the things you do to fix up the control. Theory. No, no. So I think you had any uh, mis you had misconception that what we're going to do is not control theory. I know. But <laughs> the, the, the equations look just. So let me just tell you the difference between typical control theory and what we are discussing. The only difference is that they typically talk about effectors which have continuous actuators, angle of the arm, force, velocity, and so on, those are continuous parameters. Because they are talking about continuous state spaces and continuous action spaces, the theory stays the same, the actual implementation changes significantly. The theory that we are doing and the theory that control theory does, we are taking we are taking decisions. We are figuring out what are the actions, what are the values, which action to take. Same as control, how do I change my move my arm, with which velocity do I hit you? So the alpha is not constant. Decreases over time. Yeah. But why should it decrease over time? We just had this number. No, no. Why <laughs> can't it be a constant? Because because it will not converge. We have to guarantee no, convergence. So we are only getting samples. We are only getting uh, samples from um, a distribution. We are never getting the true value. So there will be some samples which are too high, some samples which are too low. That you don't want to be using them over and over. You want to slowly decrease them. So one by alpha. Sh so the factor on the right side should tend to zero, right? Yes. yes. Which means alpha should tend to infinity. What? Oh, what, what alpha should tend to zero. Sorry, one by alpha should tend to infinity. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <sighs> Let me just give you like one slide, or three slide. In the, this is <laughs> an interest. I mean, this is really interesting, but this is also not related directly. Just to show you that there's a full field called computational neuroscience, and then there's full field called psychology, right? So what computational neuroscience does, it's somewhere in the middle of AI and psychology, it says psychologists observe something and I am going to build computational models to explain it. That is the whole exercise of computational neuroscience. Of course, if there was a, there was a real neuroscientist sitting in the audience, he'll kill me because I'm sort of making it too simplistic. But at the core, this is what they're doing. They're saying that the, the monkey's brain or the dog's brain did this and the dog reacted like this. What is my model, computation model, so that I can mimic that behavior? And if I found that model, it, you can't prove that the brain is doing the same processing, but it gives us a hint, and it also models the, uh, the animal. So we all know about Pavlov's dog, 
there was a bell and there was a food there was a bell and there was a food and after some point there was a bell and the dog started celebrating because it knew that the food had to come so it had learned the association between the bell and the uh, and the reward that is going to happen now this is instant so now let us see if we can delay the reward right interesting so we have a bell or some version of it and we don't give the food food comes 100 seconds later okay it's very simple so now if if this was an mdp what is the value as soon as i hear the bell the value is the reward right because i will add uh, the reward will back pro pro propagate i know that the reward is going to happen so i know that the reward uh, of the value of this state very close to the reward is say 100 and the value here is also 100 because i know that the reward is going to happen after one step and the reward is 100 so as soon as i hear the bell i know that after 100 time points i'm going to get a reward so i have a high value this is what will happen if i did any reinforcement learning td learning mdp is whatever it is right let's see if the monkey can learn this so <coughs> this is what my td learning uh, predicts my td learning initially has no idea so td learning initially what will it do it will say let's say every value is zero let us suppose we start with v pi f s to be zero then there was a bell nothing happened eventually 100 seconds down the line i got a reward as soon as there was a reward what happened there was a high prediction error i expected the value to be zero the reward the value is now 100 or whatever it is so i do td learning td update and so now i get some value uh, which is in the previous step is also 100 this this value back propagates So after some iterations of TD learning over and over and over, my TD learning will learn that um, as soon as the um, bell happens, the value is hundred or value is high, whatever it is. This is what the TD learning will show. Makes sense. Something like this. As soon as stimulus happened, we should know after TD learning that the value will be very high. Now. it was observed that the monkey so by the way as i was saying uh, primates people like us all of us have something called dopamine and our brain produces dopamine and you can look at the activity of a certain cells called dopaminergic cells to figure out whether the dopamine is getting produced or not or what is happening right so so before training there was a stimulus monkey had no reaction and then it got the apple juice as soon as it got the apple juice it said wow too much reward lots of dopamine activity so far so good this is what td learning also does this happened over and over and over so eventually monkey learned the fact that as soon as there is bell not right now but later i am going to get the reward so how would it dopam how would it uh, sell fire as soon as it heard the bell the cells fired later when it actually got the reward no prediction error it knew the reward is going to come so no dopamine firing so the interesting thing is that this is exactly what td learning does and this is exactly what is observed in the brain activity of the monkey and here is another interesting thing you put the bell and don't give the reward then what happens What will happen to TD learning? TD learning will expect a high reward, and when it does not get that high reward, it will have a high prediction error, right? In the negative direction. Exactly what happened in the brain. So of the monkey, uh, uh, dopamine fired when there was a bell because it knew that it was going to get a reward hundred steps down the line, and then when it did not get the reward, there was negative firing. In other words, there there was a regular firing and that reduced, equivalent to the negative reward. right so it expected something and it did not happen so so the point of the matter is that these things uh, these models that we learn in reinforcement learning people in neuroscience are trying to adapt them or use them in predicting the behavior of mammals and humans and bees and the what not so it's pretty fascinating this whole area um tyler yes sir both uh it would delay seem to introduce kind of a problem in the real world learning scenario i guess it could be that the bell goes off the monkey doesn't like the bell so he runs the other side of his cage and then the food comes out so he correlates that with 50% probability when i run to the other side of my cage the food comes out how do you 
In a real world where you're constantly moving between states and That's a great <coughs> question, and I really don't have any answer to that because I, I don't know when you really do these experiments with real monkeys, what you have to do in order to make it work. I won't give you any half baked answer on that. But I'm sure they try to do these settings control, they do they repeat it with multiple monkeys and they sort of correct for the other sources of error with the standard you get experimental measures. <laughs> Random behaviors, and those don't get rewarded, but the right behavior does get rewarded. And so behaviors that don't get rewarded become extinct over time. Yeah, which is exactly the enforcement and, I mean. And I'm betting TD learning will do the same thing. I'm sure. Yes, I'm sure. So I'm surprised why there is just, in the monkey case, why there is a spike in dopamine level when the bell goes off? So because he, he didn't know whether the bell is going to go off so or not. I would have expected, let's say, we take the dog salivating case. So never the food comes out immediately. No, after 100 seconds. Come out. So gradually now it's going to come, so gradually it should have gone up instead of a spike. No, so good point, but that is not what TD learning predicts either, right? So TD learning says as soon as the bell goes, it knows that the value of my state is now high because the, I'm going to get the reward a few steps down the line. This is exactly what the monkey does. As soon as it hears the bell, it knows that I'm going to get the reward. So there's a lot of activity. It was not expecting the reward. The reward happened. It's very happy, but the reward hasn't happened really. The monkey doesn't realize it because he, the monkey has done the back propagation. So now when the reward actually happens, it knows that the reward is going to happen. There is no new information there. There is no prediction error. So there is no activity in the monkey, brain monkey. Now why it doesn't brain of the monkey behave certain slightly differently, you have to ask somebody so else. So it's not really the reward, it's the change in the reward expectation. It's the prediction error. It's what it expected and what it gets. No. Okay, so what is the problem with TD learning? So up until now we have been discussing how to solve the problem it's a model-free method. We have learned how to compute the value for a given policy. We still haven't taken the leap of what is the right policy, which is the next thing that we're going to do. If we want to turn our value estimates into policy, then we are hosed. Why are we hosed? Because the policy is R max over Q star of SA. Our Q star of SA is summation, the transition probability R S S prime gamma V star. We know the V star, we know the immediate reward, possibly, but we do not know the transition. Because we do not know the transition probabilities, we cannot um, improve on the existing policy, which we could do in the adaptive dynamic programming setup. So therefore, what we are going to do, is, which is the main algorithm for this part of the lecture, is called Q learning. We are going to learn the Q values directly. Okay. So if we directly learn Q values, then we can just do argmax over Q. So we will know which policy to take and we will not be learning the model directly because we will not learn the transition probabilities or rewards. We will directly learn the Q values. So it will be a model free method and we will be learning lesser parameters. That is the next algorithm and actually by now you already know how to do this, which is the interesting bit. So you are in a state, you did an action, you got to a new state S prime and you got some immediate reward R. <coughs> you had the old estimate of the Q value of action A in state S. Now what is Q star of SA? It is this value. What is V star of S prime? It is max over A, Q star, uh, max over A prime, Q SA prime A prime. So you put this here. So you now know Q SA is equal to summation S prime T S A S prime R S A S prime plus gamma times max over A prime Q SA A, S prime A prime. Now this is pretty much the same kind of equation that we had here. Here we had V pi of S as summation over T R plus gamma times V. Similarly, we will now have Q is equal to summation over T R plus gamma times max over A Q. So our sample would be, we took an action, we got some immediate reward R plus we know about Q S A prime A prime. So we'll take a max. This is my sample. And once I have sample, I will do Q learning, which is nudge the value with the learning rate in uh, the direction, okay? And so if I did Q prime on this figure, this was my goal, one minus one, then what I will need to learn is I will need to learn the <coughs> table for each possible action for each state. Go up, what is the value? Go down, what is the value? Go right, what is the value? And so on. And if I learn these values over experience, over various episodes, various trajectories, then in each state, I know which action is best. For example, here it's 0.54. This state is best. 
here it's 0.61, this action is best, here it's 0 0.70, right is better, here 0 0.78, right is better, 0 0.88, right is better. So I also learned the policy using Q plus. Okay? Now I still haven't answered one question. Any guesses what I have not answered? Uh, that's a good question. Um, typically, you see whether your values are converging. If your values are converging, your values are not moving by much, then you have to. But there's still one other question that we haven't observed. We said that if I have state S, take action A, get S prime and get immediate reward R, then we can do Q update. Which action do we take? We have not yet answered that question. And we did not answer that question even when we did adaptive dynamic programming because that question is the basis of reinforcement learning because there is exploration, exploitation trade-off. If I did, so let's let's talk about this. <coughs> if I just did random action, then is that a good idea? Oh, you you'll eventually find the global. I mean, Optimal, you know, but you will never be exploiting, reasons. you will never be taking greedy action because you are never taking greedy action, you are never maximizing your reward. So in, as an agent who is living over a period of time and only doing random things, you and I know that that, that is not a, an intelligent being. School all the time. Sorry? You are in school all the time. Yeah, uh, that's one way to think about it. But even in school you are taking a psych class followed by a soccer class followed by a an AI class followed by English literature. That would be a cool guy though, but <laughs> okay. So we have to balance exploitation and exploitation trade-off. What should happen first? Exploitation or exploitation? We need to start by being more random and slowly move towards being greedy. So how do we do that? The other thing is that there's something called glide. Greedy in the limit of infinite exploration. You may be in a really bad setup and by chance, keep getting really bad outcomes with increasingly low probability, but you know, keep getting bad outcomes. So ideally, any policy, any you know, theoretically optimal policy, has to be able to explore each action in each state infinite number of times. Because if you did not do that, then a set of bad outcomes could make you decide wrong, learn wrong. So what is a good GLI policy? Well, a simple GLI policy is, be epsilon greedy. So with probability epsilon, act randomly, and with the probability one minus epsilon, do the greedy step. Take the best action. So with probability epsilon, be uh, exploratory, and with probability one minus epsilon, be exploitative. Now this starts to sound closer and closer to local search, no? <coughs> Good. Okay. So. Um, Ideally, what you would want to do is to reduce this epsilon over time. Because initially it's okay to be more exploratory, but slowly you want to reduce the epsilon so that you are uh, doing more uh, exploitation, being more greedy. So that is one solution. Lower epsilon over time, do this simple greedy. There are other possible solutions. Here is a simulated annealing analog of it, like have a temperature parameter. And this is like stochastic local search, really. You say, I'm going to choose the action stochastically. Whatever action has higher Q value, I'm going to choose it with higher probability and my temperature value slowly reduces. So that means I become less and less uh, exploratory and more and more greedy. So all of people have studied various strategies in this, but bottom line is that in any reinforcement learning, there is this exploration exploitation trade-off. You start by um, being more exploration oriented and slowly reduce your randomness in the action selection to get to um, um, more greedy, maximize reward. You can prove that under certain conditions, Q learning is going to uh, converge to optimal policy. The conditions are the environment model should not change, states and actions are finite, rewards are bounded, learning rate decays, does not decay too quickly. So these are the technical conditions for it. And that exploration method that we just talked about would not star any state action pair. So it would guarantee infinite visits to every state action pair over an infinite training period. Again, it's a technical condition. Uh, that's why we have glide, which is within the limit of infinite exploration. Here is a summary of where we are. 
what we just did are two types of reinforcement learning methods, model based and model free. In model based we have um, direct estimation, uh, no, we have just learning the parameters, we will have to estimate S square A parameters. In model free we have to estimate only S times A parameters because we are doing learning Q value. So it requires relatively less data but in a model based setting if you had some prior knowledge like you can only visit the next neighbors and not more then it's easy to make use of that kind of knowledge. Reinforcement learning has been extremely extremely valuable and there are just a ton of applications and in the next few minutes let's see a couple of fun videos and uh, then we will take a quick break.